we've got 17 so far so that's fine okay well good evening everybody and it's lovely to have you here even though we've got this lovely weather which is a bit rare but um of a, a nice balmy evening anyway and as I said, lovely to have you here. I'm going to run through a little bit of housekeeping, how we're going to manage this Zoom meeting, and it's a workshop, so how we're going to manage the Zoom workshop. Um, first of all, just to let you know that this is being recorded, and please do let us know if you have any problems about um, this being recorded. There will be a chance for Q&A later on in the workshop. Um, if you don't want to be brought out to speak, you can just have your question written, So, but this will be recorded and can be used um, later. We'll start, as I say, now we're going to have about half an hour of presentations and we'll run through those presentations and they've got a lovely logic and we have some wonderful speakers here, as you can see, lined up. And at the end of that half an hour, we'll then have the rest of the meeting for an interactive Q&A. And how will we run this? We're going to use, as this is a Zoom webinar, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there are two different controls that we're going to use. The chat function, which you can see on your left-hand side, the chat function is for you to chat. It's to express an opinion. It's to share something that you've thought of while somebody's speaking, perhaps. It's for networking. So the chat can just run on and you're talking amongst yourselves while paying lots of attention, obviously, to our wonderful speakers. But that's the chat function that's going on. On the right hand side, we have the Q and A and the Q and A function is only for questions. And that way that helps us to see what are the specific questions that aren't lost amongst the traffic in the in the chat function. So you press on the Q and A button and you type in your question that you would like to um, give. Now, the lovely thing about this is while people are speaking and a question occurs to you, you can just type it into the Q and A. We've also got a sort of a democratic system, so to avoid duplication of questions, but also to give us an idea of what you think are the most interesting and relevant questions, is that you can press the like um, icon there against the questions that you think are really interesting. And in that way, all the questions will still remain, but the ones that get most likes will sort of move up to the top. And as chair, then I'll know which ones to ask first of all. And that's our housekeeping. And I've got a little bit of an introduction to this evening that we have together here for the Zero Carbon Communities Grant. And the session is about how to write successful grant applications for our Zero Carbon Community Grants. But first of all, I'd just like to sort of recall how lovely it is to have you all here, especially after we've just come through this really difficult time, you know, with the pandemic, with COVID-19, when in a way we've all been isolated for so long and we're just starting to break out again, but it has been a tough time and a tough time for many people. And that might be through illness, it might be through um, being locked down and juggling all the responsibilities at home, it may be through financial um, troubles, maybe even dealing with stress and anxiety of loved ones and, and loneliness perhaps and being kept apart from, from people we love. So it has been, you know, a really, really difficult time. But we do need to also celebrate something that we have seen, and that's the resurgence of, of a community spirit and what we can call community resilience. And community resilience is something which is talked about and is studied hugely around the climate and ecological emergency, how we can become stronger and more resilient communities in the face of the huge uncertainty and the changing climate and what that will mean for our lives and for our children's lives. And so what we've seen is throughout South Cams are the emergence of a social infrastructure of street coordinators, of people providing food, collecting prescriptions, helping out with little tasks, finding out perhaps who on the street uh, may be unable to help themselves, may be lonely, giving an extra word, a phone call, and that huge, amazing infrastructure that we've seen happening in all of the villages is, is just fantastic. And we've also seen something that we didn't imagine a couple of years ago, is the disruptive 
shift in our behavior, which was imposed upon us because of the lockdown. So we saw a disruptive shift in terms of our traveling patterns, our commuting patterns, in the use of the car, in the use of public transport. We've seen disruption in terms of our office working and the move towards working from home and going digital instead of um, the massive car journeys, train journeys, flights around the world. We've also seen disruption in terms of how we source our food and being understanding of finding locally sourced products because we haven't been able to go into the larger shops and we've looked more at the digitalization of that and many pop-up businesses which have come closer to home as well with that entrepreneurial um, spirit and hugely we've seen the importance of green space of wild open space to our mental and physical health and the fact that there is a terrible awful inequality in our own, own communities around South Cambridgeshire in terms of access, easy access to that green space, which is so, so critical, especially when, when you're in lockdown. And work that we've been doing in terms of planning at the moment has shown that South Cambridgeshire is the poorest area in the country in terms of biodiversity and tree canopy cover. And that's not great if we're looking at things like our climate and ecological emergency, about the natural habitat around us and the role that that plays both for absorbing carbon and making us healthy. So while these cause difficulties, they also shifted behaviour patterns so fast, accelerated trends that were already happening, that we need to look now at which one of those do we want to lock in, keep, because they're actually good for society. And how do we keep them if we want to? And how do we keep and build on that community spirit so that the behaviour change, we're doing it together in a supportive way? And that's why the Zero Carbon Community Grants Fund is so crucial that it's happening now. And we, we timed it to sort of make it that we were in the period where we're coming out, we can come together and, and talk like this, and you can meet as you're starting to design your grant applications. But you'll see that there's a greater emphasis this time on the evaluation criteria around the community engagement, because it's that behavioral change that we need moving all together towards a zero carbon lifestyle, much of which we've started to just see in what's happened to us over the last year and a half. So I would like now to take you to Emma Dyer, who is our real host for this evening, but I will be chairing the proceedings and the chat and Q&A. But Emma, if you'd like to take us now through the agenda. Thank you, Pippa. Um, as Pippa said, I'm Emma Dyer and I work at South Cam's District Council as a Climate and Environment Project Officer and I oversee the Zero Carbon Communities Grant Scheme. So today's workshop is a chance to learn about our grants, understand what we are looking for during the scoring process and hopefully provide you with some useful tips to go home with. There will also be an opportunity to ask questions at the end via the Q&A session, as Pippa said. Um, so before I'd go on, I go on, I'd like to introduce our speakers who have kindly joined us today. Um, oh, so bear with me, sorry. Um, yeah, so um, I was delighted to be joined today by two guest speakers, Sally Page from CCVS and also Cheryl Cousins from the Gambling Gate Eco Community Group. Sally will provide a more in-depth look at how you can pick up extra points and give some expert advice when writing grant applications. And Cheryl from Gambling Gate Eco Community Group secured funding in round one of our grants and she will provide some background on her project and her plans for this year. After our presentations, we will happily answer any questions you may have. Um, so, um, the Zero Carbon Community Grant Scheme's aims are summarised in this slide. As you can see, the scheme one supports communities to promote behavioural change and reduce reliance on fossil fuels. Two, it aligns with our aspiration for net zero carbon by 2050 in our zero carbon strategy. And three, has a £100,000 total budget. Um, so if you look at our funded projects so far in the table, you'll see that in the final column, 40 applications received in the first year slightly more in the second year, and funding has been awarded to a total of 36 projects. 
I've included the breakdown in terms of types of projects. So as you can see, there are lots of applications for community building projects, but unless they were imaginative in how the, their project was going to engage the community, they didn't get funded. So um, the success rate for projects to encourage cycling and um, tree planting obviously was lo a lot better for those years too. Um, so in the next slide, you should be able to see some examples of the projects that we've already funded. Starting in the top left hand corner, we have the Orchard Park shared electric cargo bike, which provides sustainable transport for families in the new settlement of the Orchard Park on the edge of Cambridge. It has also recently provide, um, proved useful in providing transport for community litter picks. This is one of 12 projects encouraging cycling, which we have funded, <clears throat> including a couple of electric bike subsidised rental schemes. And you can see the launch of one um, in Great Abington in the top centre, and you can see Pippa <laughs> nicely in the middle of that one. Um, we also funded a project to promote the National School Streets Initiative in our district. This sets up temporary road restrictions outside schools. And we also funded a couple of initiatives to teach people to repair their bikes and various projects to provide cycle paths and parking. The bottom middle um, photo shows some of the recently installed cycle racks at Milton Country Park by Milton Cycling Campaign, who are planning to install many more racks in other kilo locations. In the bottom left, we have a tree and hedge planting initiative in Camborne another of our new settlements, this one involving the school. And bottom right shows a tree being planted by the Histon and Impington Trees Action Group. In total, a thousand trees and 750 metres of hedges will be planted. Tree planting for carbon sequestration has proved very popular and we have funded 14 of these initiatives. It's the conversations leading to these types of projects which are really valuable. In um, the picture in the top right shows Ickleton Village Hall, whose inefficient lighting was replaced with low energy equivalents. And their Village Hall Open Day explains their aim to be greener. So when we fund energy improvements for community buildings, this is the kind of engagement we want to see, a village event where people can come and find out what they can do in their own homes, in their own lives. On to the next slide. Um, this summarises the key information on this year's grant. If you have a look at it, if you please note that the deadline is earlier than in rounds one and two on Friday the 30th of July. And the next slide um, is all about who can apply. So it's as previously, any non-profit organisation or parish council can apply. You'll need to be based in South Cambridgeshire, but if you're based outside, you can still apply, but your project will need to benefit South Cambridgeshire residents. So just some examples of non-profit organisations. We have um, registered charities, companies limited by guarantee, unincorporated associations or clubs, community interest companies, charitable incorporated organisations, community benefit societies, social enterprises, established voluntary sector organisations or community shops which are non-profit making. So this year we'll be breaking the grant down into three streams. So we have community buildings, nature and our other category. Community buildings and nature were the most popular with our applicants last year. So we wanted to include these again, but also provide an extra smaller category for other bold and ambitious projects which meet our objectives, objectives to a high standard. So now onto the objectives. We will be scoring on how your project achieves the following. The first objective, here it is really important to consider the wider community engagement aspect of your project and ensure, that, and ensure this is more than just publicity, but something that will help promote behaviour change in reducing carbon emissions. For example, how has the community been involved in drawing up these proposals? What plans are there for community involvement in the project in the future? What difference will the project make to your community? How many adults and children volunteers will be involved in the project? How will your project inspire and encourage others to do similar projects? The second objective is the reduction of CO2 in the atmosphere. This needs to be measurable in some form. So this could, this could be an estimate, but we would expect some form of explanation as to how you arrived at your answer. If you're applying for funding through our nature theme, you will also need to include how you will be providing new or enhanced habitats for wildlife. And finally, additional value. This could include funding contributions or contributions in kind, 
for example, volunteer time or expertise from other sources, um, collaboration between organisations or evidence of local or member support. We would like to stress that part funding from other organisations will be taken into consideration, especially if you're requesting more than £5,000. It is important to also note that due to the number of applications we're expecting to receive, competition will be high and we will be unable to fund all projects. For that reason, we'd like to highlight to not assume that submitting an application will result in funding. And the next slide, if we go, I'm going to go through each of the, the three themes. So this is the community building theme. Um, in our community building theme, we'll be interested in funding improvements to community buildings to reduce the need for fossil fuel energy. So, for example, grid electricity, gas or oil. We will prioritise improvements which take a whole building approach, um, which take into account the energy hierarchy, as shown on the slide. This ranks the stages on which, um, on the way of by, to using less energy in a building. We will also be prioritising improvements that have already been recommended on an energy survey. So energy conservation measures could include draft proofing, insulation of walls, ceilings, roofs, floors and pipes and the replacement of doors and windows. Energy efficiency measures could include lighting upgrades, smart heating control units or infrared heating. And then with solar PV and all the battery storage system for solar PV, it's important that you show um, that feasible energy conservation and energy efficiency measures have already been undertaken, or you have um, a plan to undertake these. So example is the funding by savings from the solar PV scheme. So we will prioritise schemes where a significant proportion of electricity generated will be used on sites, either through daytime use of the building or through battery storage. With our community building applications, we'd like to stress that only those applications that include a community engagement aspect will score the most points. It's about more than just improving the energy efficiency of a building. For example, Willingham Parish Council, um, they received £13,142 in the last round to install infrared heating panels in their village hall. This is known to many of you as Ploughman Hall. They will be increasing awareness of the energy savings in buildings to the wider community through the Willingham News, which is delivered free to every household. Plus, they have plans to hold an exhibition in the local library and an event in their low energy refurbished uh, village hall. So on to our nature theme. With our nature theme, we are looking to fund a variety of tree planting and other nature based solutions to help combat climate change and increase biodiversity. Consideration will be given to projects which capture CO2 from the atmosphere or prevent its release, whilst at the same time creating or restoring natural habitats. And some examples you could consider here could be um, the planting of a landmark tree in a small space, planting of a small tree population, a community orchard projects, a community tree nursery projects, community allotment projects, the creation or enhancement of a community nature area, a small scale res restoration of peatland, or a hedge or larger village wide tree canopy project. With our other projects category, you can devise your own projects. Of interest to us are bold, ambitious and imaginative projects that are able to fulfil given objectives to a high standard. Here examples could include community initiatives and events that promote sustainable lifestyle choices, improvements to cycling infrastructure, a project to promote cycling or any waste reduction products, projects. So, um, so the application process, this is a little bit more about what we're looking for. So we've, we've, we've made the application process easier. Um, guidance will also provide, be provided in the help buttons next to the questions on the application form. You have an option to choose one of our options or devise your own projects and you can apply for more than one project. And if you'd applied to us before and been awarded funding, you're more than welcome to apply again this year. All projects will need to meet the objectives as stated in our guidance document. So just a few reminders before you apply. Please take your time and read the guidance notes, which includes the objectives already mentioned. Please remember that part funding is looked upon favourably, especially in the case of projects asking for over £5,000. If you are um, seeking less than £1,000, we would encourage you to apply to the community chest. And lastly, we are more than happy to discuss your project with us. 
with you if you think that you um if you think that would help um so you could email us at the email address given which is zcc at scans.gov.uk um alternatively we can put you in contact with a previous applicant who has given their permission to offer any advice um so here's details of the web page where you can see our guidance notes apply now button and a link to all our previously funded projects so once the deadline has been reached, we'll aim to inform our applicants of their success within two months. Um, and just be aware that we will also require a brief end of project report. Um, this is typically after about a year, we sort of say that the, you know, the, the grants, you, you have basically a year to um, complete the project. Um, and the, the report have to outline the impact of the project and any lessons learned. Um, and further information, um, here are mine and Siobhan's contact details. And um, thank you for listening. Emma, um, just one thing, we just had yeah. a request. Would you be able to just go back to the nature slide? Yes. And just make, one. Um, yes, just the, the types of um, oh. projects. Yes. So I think people thought it was a bit quick, so they could just sort of have a chance to. Yes, of course. Um, and I think oh, the slides will be shared, won't they? They will be, yes, that's right. So I think Siobhan, have you gone back to that one? Yes, she has. Yes. So um, these are just some of the examples. So if I just run through those again, we've got um, the planting of a landmark tree in a small open space, um, the planting of a small tree population. So if you've got a small little area that you want to plant some trees in, um, a community orchard project or a community tree nursery project community allotment projects, creation or enhancement of a community nature area, small scale restoration of peatland, or a hedge or larger village wide bee canopy project. Okay. Is that okay? That's perfect, thank you very okay much. That. Yep, that's very good. Okay, so um, thanks for listening. I'll now hand over to, over to Sally from CCBS, who will run through her tips for making successful grant applications. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, lovely to be here this evening. Um, so just to introduce myself a little bit again. Um, my name's Sally. I'm a development worker for the CCBS, which is the Cambridge Council for Voluntary Service. Um, so just in case you're not familiar with us, um, we're a registered charity set up to kind of champion and support community and voluntary groups. And we also promote volunteering across Cambridge and City, South Cambridgeshire and Fenland. Um, so today I'm going to talk you through some tips for making a successful grant application. And this should be helpful for the Zero Carbon Communities Grant Programme, um, but also you know, for other funders, if you've got other ideas up your sleeve, um, then that should be helpful. Um, and as, as we said earlier, please do pop questions in the Q&A so that I can answer them um, later on in the evening. Um, at the end of my presentation, I'll also share my contact details and give you a little bit more information about the CCBS and how we might be able to help you um, as a group or as an organisation. Um, OK, so if I go into my first slide, um, so... I think really first thing first, if you're thinking of applying for funding is really to get to grips with, you know, what is your project? Um, so this slide might look like lots of questions, um, but it's really important to kind of develop your project idea before finding that funder and putting all the work into an application. Um, so hopefully these kinds of questions will help you kind of get to that point where you can give an elevator pitch about your project. So you want to be able to talk to a stranger for two minutes and for them to get a really good idea about you know what your project is and um, why it needs to happen and why you think it should happen now as well and um, so what I'll do is just talk through these questions a little bit um, and hopefully that will get your cogs turning and you'll have lots of ideas um, after this evening and um, so first of all and really importantly um, what is the problem and what is the solution and um, so really this is you kind of explaining what the issue is that you want to address with your project and um, this will help you explain the need for your project say to a funder um, and it will help you kind of think about why you can explain that your project is the best solution to that problem and um, linked to this is kind of is there demand so can you show that other people want this project to happen so 
that might be other people in your community. Can you collect um, proof of that? So maybe statistics or um, support letters from those people saying that this project is a really good idea and they want to see it go ahead. So basically you're making your case to the funder as to why this project is the best solution. And um, then the next point is who will be involved in the project? Um, so what will they do? How will they do it? Um, and with this kind of carbon grant program, it links to, you know, if you're involving a school or families in activities. So really being able to explain who will be involved. What will the project do? So this is kind of the nuts and bolts, I suppose. Um, how will your project be delivered? Um, what will happen and when will that happen? So you do want to start thinking about the project timetable. How long do you think it's going to take? Um, just making sure that you're giving yourself enough time in the planning to achieve what you want to achieve. And that takes me to the next point. Um, so this is really thinking about what will change as a result of the project. And again, this is really building on your kind of case for investment, why somebody should fund you. Um, and this bit sounds a little bit of funder jargon, so just bear with me and I will explain. Um, but first of all, you can think about, you know, what your project will do, which is often called the kind of output um, and the outcomes that will be achieved as a result, which is the change. So really it's kind of, if you think of a bike rack as an output, so a thing, um, and then the change might be as a result of having that thing. Um, people might be living healthier lives because they're cycling to the shops rather than driving. And so you've made that change as a result of your project. And it's just trying to get your head around that, again, building that case for investment. And the next point is how will you measure impact? So how will you show the funder that your project's doing what you said it would? So this is thinking about the delivery of the project and how you'll monitor and evaluate what you're doing. Um, it's really good to think about that earlier on because then you can build it into your application and make sure that you've got the funding that you need in order to do that well. And this kind of scale of this will really depend on your project. Um, the bigger projects will need more and resource behind this and the, the smaller ones less. So what resources do you need? Um, so I think with this, just really keeping in mind that it's not just money or kind of stuff. Um, and this was touched on before with Emma, um, thinking about if there's staff needed or if there's volunteers that will be needed to deliver the project. You know, where will you get them from? What will they be doing? Um, what costs might they need to be involved in the project? So with volunteers, it's often kind of expenses um, or some money to kind of put on a thank you event for them at the end of the project. And then this might sound a bit in the, the horizon, um, but what will happen once you've spent the grant? So I think this is just really thinking about, you know, the future. If, for example, there's some physical changes or things are being installed through your project, you know, who's going to look after them in the long term? Will there be ongoing costs, for example? Um, and if so, how will these be met? That will be a, a question that funders will ask you. Um, it might be that in order to answer that, you want to form a partnership or that you'll need to think about kind of raising funds later on down the line. And um, so it's just making sure that you're happy with that and you're taking on something that's manageable for you. OK, so that's probably got your head spinning a little bit, but hopefully you've got lots of ideas. Um, so you've got your lovely project um, and now you're thinking about getting ready to apply. Um, so first things first would be kind of who will fund your project. And hopefully from today, you know, the Zero Carbon Communities Programme is a really perfect match for you. Um, but I did just want to mention that there's Support Cambridgeshire, which is a website that hosts an online search engine um, for finding funders. And um, it's really, really helpful. So if today you think, oh, actually, this isn't the perfect fit where I've got other ideas, do have a look. Um, we at the CVS can also help with funding, um, but I'll mention that more at the end. And I think it's worth mentioning here that, you know, there might be more than one fun funder that matches your project or maybe matches a little bit, but it's just really good to stay focused, you know, think about what works for your funder, for your project, and make sure you find the funder that matches that. Um, and then, you know, you can get going on your application. So the next point on this slide is, you know, what does the funder need from you? So this is really about kind of getting organised, getting those practical things together so that you meet the minimum criteria that the funder asks for. And um, you really don't want to miss out because of the technicality. Um, and often funders won't come back to you, say, if you miss 
um, a document that you were meant to upload or you don't quite meet the criteria in, in some particular way. Um, so do double check. Um, the list on the slide um, tells you some of the documents that you're very likely to need. And for this particular grant program, you know, you'll be checking the guidance about that, like Emma's gone through earlier. But here are just some examples. Um, so they'll ask you to be constituted, have a bank account in the name of the group, um, accounts, um, have all the appropriate permissions, relevant partnerships in place and key policies in place, which might be things like health and safety or safeguarding. So I think my advice is if you're looking at that list and you think, oh gosh, no, we're not ready yet. We're not there yet as a, a group or organization, you can contact us at the CCVS and we can help with getting you all set up. Um, but if you see that and you're, you know, you, you're there and that all looks familiar, really it's just about making sure everything's up to date, everything's to hand. And then when you move on to the next stage, um, you know, it's easy for you to get your application in to the grant program you're interested in. Um, so if we move on to writing the application, which is the next slide. Um, so you've got your project idea, you found your perfect funder, you've got all your documents kind of up to date and ready, and then you move on to the application form. Um, so this can be a little bit daunting, but hopefully these kind of top tips will help you through that process. And again, would apply generally across the board to different funders. Um, so the first one, uh, read the guidance and talk to the funder. So Emma's already said, you know, please do get in touch and ask questions. Um, you know, all funders have guidance to accompany their grant programs. Um, so do dig that out and um, don't be a stranger. Make sure you ask the questions. It will save you time um, and make sure that you're applying to a fund that, you know, suits your idea. And with the guidance, you know, have it next to you, get your highlighters out make sure you're really using it so that it will support you when you are answering all the different questions that the funder needs you to answer. So my next point is use clear writing style and be concise. Um, so I suppose this is really just to kind of highlight that the person reading your application will have lots of applications to read, they'll have criteria to assess your application against. And basically you want to make it as easy as possible for them to kind of understand who you are and why your project should be funded by them. So using clear language, using headings if you can, bullet points if you can, keeping to the word count, um, and I suppose not seeing the word count as a target. So if it's 500 words, you don't always need to write 500 words, but just make sure you're getting your point across as clearly as you can. I think that's a really good step. And um, so the next point, answer the questions. This might sound a little bit odd, but really all I mean by this is, you know, don't skip bits that you, um, unless you meant to, you're meant to. Um, and if your funder's asking you something, it's really because they want to hear about it. So an example is if one of their objectives is getting funding um, for your project to raise awareness of the environment, you know, make sure you give clear examples of how your project will do that. Um, rather than just saying it will, just try and elaborate and explain how your project will meet the objectives that they're asking for, which Emma touched on a little bit before as well. And the next is find a critical friend. Um, and I think this can be really, really helpful. You know, great um, writing grant applications can take time. You know, you're likely to be really invested in your project and it's easy to miss out on the basics. So just presume that the person reading the application doesn't know anything about you. Um, they'll only be able to use the information that you give them. Um, so get someone who doesn't know the project to read it for you before you submit. And really, if they can read your application, understand what you want to do um, and can see that you've not kind of missed information out that means it doesn't really make much sense, then you're off to a good start. But I definitely recommend that. The next point is make sure the budget adds up. And again, this kind of links to the critical friend, having someone there to read th things through with you. Um, but also just making sure you're including all the costs that you'll need to deliver your project. Um, don't be tempted to undercost your project because then that might look a bit risky. The funder might not be sure as to how you'd actually deliver it. And um, keep things in mind like partnership funding, which Emma mentioned before. So getting a little bit of money from somewhere else um, to go into your project. And that does help to show that other people support what you're looking to do and you've thought through your different options as well. And then the last bit is just check and check again. So I guess this kind of 
links to all of the different things that I've said here but you know don't do this on your own don't be a lone soldier and have a little team behind you you'll need them if you're delivering the project later on um so do you know enlist people to help you with writing your application um, and if I just go on to the last slide so this is just a quote um, from Helen Keller so she was an author activist lecturer um, and she said oh alone we can do so little together we can do so much so I think this is just a reminder to talk to people you know talk to the funder talk to your community talk to organizations like the CCVS and um, it will help you plan your project and then find the right funder and then in turn put in a good quality application um, as Emma said lovely. yeah thank you very much yeah that's lovely thank you Thank you, Sally. Um, that was really useful. I'd now like to hand over to Cheryl Cousins from the Gambling Gate Eco Community Group. Thank you for inviting me this evening. Um, I'm Cheryl Cousins, um, Chairperson for Gambling Gate Eco Community Group. Um, and we applied to South Cambridgeshire for funding for the Zero Carbon Community Grant in round one, and we were um, successful. Um, if you could put this to the next slide, group, please, that'd be great. So the community group was set up to raise awareness of environmental impact and to encourage the community to make better informed decisions to reduce their carbon footprint. So we had a couple of key aims. One was to help the community of Gamlingay to use less single use plastic um, and to help the community learn more about what they can and cannot recycle in their area. So it really, where did the actual group come from? Well, it was really born out of an idea between um, myself and a, a, a friend. And we're very much concerned about the, um, how much plastic, plastic, single use plastic is used. And we wanted to try and make a difference and we really didn't know where to start. And, and when we saw the funding advertised, we thought that's something we could, could apply for. So we, had nothing we had no group set up at all so we literally had to set up the gamma gay eco community group get a bank account constitution together um put our policies and procedures in place all what sally was talking about and actually we found it quite a simple process to do um we had the idea about trying to use less single-use plastic and had some ideas around that so as part before we actually sat down and put pen to paper and filled out the application form we obviously read all the guidance and we had our ideas but we still didn't know if it was going to be a fit so we actually had a meeting met with um uh, with uh south cambridgeshire district council for emma and a colleague and actually sounded out our ideas and what they thought of them and whether that was something that would be suitable we were very much were keen on doing community um, engagement. So can someone put me on to the next slide and we can talk about how we did that. So we had an idea that what we wanted to do was um, have a, a monthly pop up eco shop. We wanted to kind of use the funding to purchase um, non plastic alternatives to products, so things like alternative mouthwashes, uh, dog poo bags, um, shampoo bars, rather using plastic bottle shampoos, and to be able to give this out to the community. So we plan to have a monthly pop-up shop in the Gamley Gate Eco Hub. Unfortunately, we were all systems ready to go and had it cancelled due to COVID and the various lockdowns, but we are planning to still go ahead with that next month. In the meantime, what we have been doing is we set up a Facebook page for our community um, where we engage with our community through that. So we try and to highlight alternatives to single use plastic. We have Waste Not Wednesday. So someone in, who lives in the village will say, I've got a cabbage left in my fridge today. Anybody got any ideas or how I can use that? And everyone's been chipping in with different recipe ideas. So that's that's been great. We've been using our local uh, 
communication. So in Gambling Gay, we have um, a, a, a gazette that goes out once a month. So we've been putting regular articles in that about what we've been doing. And what we've really done is we've worked with our local um, rainbow, particularly our brownie and our guiding groups in Gambling Gay to reduce their single use plastic. Next slide, please. So what we've been doing with the brownies and guys is due to COVID, it's been virtual sessions. But what we did, we did a session where we actually invited all the brownies and guides in their separate events to collate all their single use plastic from their bathroom, look at the products. We discussed alternatives to those. We actually provided them with free samples of shampoo bars and soap bars for them to try. They it was brilliant because they were engaging with us about what they'd like to see the changes um, in the future and future products. Um, and then we did a follow up session with them to see how they got on with the products as well. And we're hoping to run, do that again next year to see how they've done in terms of reducing their plastic in, in, just in their bathrooms. But also through promoting that through social media, we've had other community groups like the Scouts have said to us, please, can you run that session with us as well? So that's just giving you a flavour of some of the community engagement that we're trying to, to get going and continuing in Gambling Gay. And I'm, I'll happily share our community group Facebook page um, with you so that if any of you want to join that, that'd be great. And you can see what we're doing. So thank you. That's just us really from Gambling Gay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So thank you. <laughs> um, yes, your project is really inspiring and shows exactly what we mean by the wider community engagement. So thank you. Absolutely. Um, Isn't that wonderful? It just gives you such a lovely warm glow. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> Good. Thank you so much. So um, if you're right, Emma, we'll move into the Q&A. Is that OK? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Good, yeah. lovely. And um, so the first question that we have that has been upvoted with three likes, <laughs> so it's come to the top of the pile, is around the community buildings. And in terms of that, um, the energy hierarchy that you, you know, you, you showed on your slide there, the question is, how about air source heat pumps? And, and Peter Allen, we can actually give you the floor if you'd like to follow up with that supplementary question that you had there that gave us a bit of an understanding of your question. Is Peter there? Yes, I, I'm uh, in the process of, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. In the process of, um, project managing a heat pump installation in a church uh, building that's occupied by the equivalent of the vicar. And I've had a heat pump for some time and I'm a retired engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, but the critical thing for community buildings is heat pumps are very good at constant level. They're very efficient when the temperature gets constant level. Yeah. If you want to, um, have a building that you only use in the evenings and expect it to be nice and warm when you get in just after you switched on the heat pump it won't work it takes hours to get the thermal mass of the building up to temperature yeah and they're inefficient at that you're much better off using um for depends on the occupancy ratio it, yeah. it, you're uh, just using occasional use building infrared heaters make it feel comfortable without heating the whole mass of the building up um, that's my experience. Okay, thank you, Peter. So the question was from Mark, and that was something that came in. Thank you very much, Peter, for um, helping a bit on that. Does anybody on the panel want to answer about sort of air source heat pumps? Yes, I'll um, just say something. So I'm I'm Siobhan. Um, so the the I mean I, I absolutely take the points made um, uh, around making sure that the, whatever the heating is, it's going to work for that building absolutely dead on. Um, the, but aside from that, the issue for us around heat pumps has been that the government um, funding scheme to help fund um, heat pumps is the renewable heat incentive. 
And the requirements for that government funding scheme are if the money comes from a public authority, then you're not eligible for the renewable heat incentive. So we're not very keen to, to spend um, to, to spend the zero carbon community um, grant on heat pumps for that reason. And um, because it, it, it's sort of not additional funding as it were. Um, however, the, if, in a scheme where the uh, heat pump is a, is a good option, if, you know, if there are other aspects of the larger project that, that we could fund maybe, um, anything that doesn't prevent you from getting the grant from the government. And I would also say that if it's a really uh, excellent project and a good reason is made, then, you know, we would consider it. So I think it's one to, um, it's hard to be black and white on it. It's one to discuss with us. And I think it's very much linked as well, perhaps and, um, with one of the other questions, which is around um, the community aspect of that, I would suppose, Siobhan as well and, and, and Emma, which is, you know, you must also, apart from all the technical side of that, consider how wide a community engagement that you, you can actually achieve through that project. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, you say that you're from a church. So, oh, you know, the obvious solution there would be, you know, obviously church services. You know, if you were going to sort of, you know, have a lot of people together, you could um, share the benefits of what you're doing with the, with the community in that way. So it's all about sort of leading by example. So that would be something that we would obviously encourage. So. Good, Emma. so we've got, I think it's linked to another question by Lynn Tranter, who's saying, you know, around community buildings as well, if a centre is only used by one client group, how can wider community engagement be achieved? You know, would it still meet the criteria? Um, yes, I mean, I think what we have to realise is that everything's a scale to everything. So if you've got a sort of smaller community building and smaller things, but, you know, relatively speaking, you might be requesting less. So we have to sort of consider all of these things when we sort of, you know, allocate the money. So, you know, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're looking for sort of bold, innovative sort of projects. So if you can think of something, you know, even if it, you know, it might not necessarily reach a thousand people, but if it's reaching some people, that's good. And obviously, you know, we would encourage that. Good, thank you. And then continuing the theme around the community buildings part of the, um, the grants. So what about providing EV charging points, Mark Parrish asks. Um, Siobhan, I think you're... Well, we that one. <laughs> yeah, so, so EV charging points, again, it's a little bit the, the, of a similar issue in terms of the additionality. There is this government funding towards electric vehicle charging points. In particular, there's two pots of funding. A fairly, one which gives a fairly small amount, um, which is the workplace charging scheme. So if the place that you're wanting to put the electric vehicle charging point is a workplace, then you'd be able to get that. And we would be happy to receive an application. Again, community engagement important, but we'd be really keen to see that that, um, that, that funding has been, been sought. It's quite easy to get that one. Um, and then there's, there's, there's much more funding available from the government. The, um, it's called the on-street residential charging scheme. And that is 75% of the, of, of the costs of, um, of the electric vehicle charging point. It's a bit more difficult to get that because you need to make a case that, um, that there is demand for the um, electric vehicle charging point and you need to um, get the, 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 you need to get um, a uh, road traffic, I can't remember the, the, the phrase for it, but you need to, to designate the, um, the bay. So again, no, one, one to discuss really to work out whether that's possible. Um, also, we don't have a particular theme for electric vehicle charging points. So you, you, you're gonna be, it's gonna be quite competitive if you're putting in a fund for that. So if you can get some of the funding from elsewhere, if you can show really good community engagement, those are all things which would, would really help. So it might go into the, the other, the third sort of criteria. Yeah. And then you've got to be sort of very, very special. Yeah, like you say, competitive and show how it's um, quite a special project. Good. And then we do have a question from Kate Britton. Kate, are you there? Are you there, Kate? Hi, Pippa. 
Hello there. Do you want to, you have a question there, Kate, about funding going towards capital purchase? Yeah, so we have a village project where there was a piece of land coming up for sale. Um, and it's a very special piece of land. It's been left for 20 years to sort of rewild. Um, and we've got a community kind of organization project together to try and buy this piece of land for the community um, forever and perhaps form our own charity. But obviously this grant would go to, towards a sort of small part of the capital purchase price of, of that land. And I wondered whether that was something the grant could go towards or whether we'd be better off seeing whether there's any particular equipment or planting needs or fencing or access that it could go towards. Because you need funding for all of those things. So you're just saying, where do you pitch this for the yeah, grant? Yeah, exactly. Well, how, do, how do I pitch it best? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pippa. Okay. Emma, do you want to, do yeah, you want to of course. Yeah. I try, yes, of course. Or should I have a bash up to you? Um, I don't mind. I mean, I, I suppose it all depends on how much the land is, because obviously land is, you know, can be quite expensive. So, um, but yes, capital costs, absolutely fine. If something's helping, you know, your project, um, so if you wanted some sort of stakes or something or um, protection guards for your trees, um, tools or anything, that's absolutely fine. But again, you know, we, it's going to be very competitive, this grant. So, you know, if, if, if your project was asking for a lot of money, say the, the maximum amount, £15,000, you have to bear in mind that, you know, again, community engagement, everything is, you know, <laughs> there's a lot to consider. So to get £15,000, you're going to have to sort of, you know, try really hard. And, you know, it depends how much you could buy with £15,000 as well. And what I imagine would be part of the evaluation criteria comes in with Kate's second question I see here, Kate, which is about mm. how you measure um, the carbon reduction that would be, um, is that right, Kate, was connected with that same project, are you asking? Yes, absolutely. I, I would have no idea how we, how we go about that, so advice on that would be okay, really valued. Yeah. Well, we've provided some guidance that comes with our um, our actual. Um, if you go onto our web page, when you the apply page, if you go onto the guidance notes, um, there's also little help buttons next to each question. So basically, you know, like I say, it can be an estimate, but if you know the number of trees and what sizes of the trees, you can use that. And you can also go onto the Woodland Carbon Code website. So um, if you upload all your information, it should be able to give you some kind of figure. Now, I've not seen it exactly in, in action, so I'm not exactly sure, you know, how accurate. But if, as long as you've sort of given us a little bit of an idea of how many trees and the sizes, that's, that's still really good. So <laughs> is that OK? That's great. Thank you very much. Really helpful. Good. And so maybe you can provide some of those links. I think, Siobhan, you mentioned some of those around the EV charging points. Emma, if you've got sort of yeah. any links in the chat to where those um, those can be found as yes, well. Great. And um, Lynn Trander, are you with us, Lynn? Hi, Lynn. Do you want to, are you able to say your question? Which is about, you know, if, if something you're you're saying it's going to cost so much and you're hoping to get some match funding, um, what happens if if that isn't there by the time that is that, you know, if the time that the project goes in? Are you there, Lynn? Yep, that's it. Spot on. <laughs> so can you put a grant in with the with the chance that you might be able to raise the rest of the money? Yes. Um. Do you, want, do you want to answer that or do you want me to answer it? I yes, like... I mean, I think that there are, um, yeah, it can be difficult, isn't it, when you're trying to get funds from several places and it, and you're sort of juggling juggling that. Um, it, it, where funding is agreed, that is going to be hugely helpful um, in terms of, 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 um, of your application. Um, yeah, I think it, it 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 all depends what else comes in, but I think that 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 it's going to be quite difficult for us to give funding in a situation where it's not clear that um, clear where the rest of it's going to come from. Yeah, and I can imagine with with any land thing, it would also be a, about sort of ownership of the land. You might have to sort of show that you really do own the land or are able to. And and I noticed Lynn's question was about community building. So yeah, on that one. Thank you, Lynn. Does that answer your question? Yeah, really clear. Good, wonderful. And we do have a final question here from Robert. It's quite a, a personal one, specific one, but it may be relevant to everybody. Robert, are you there?
Hi, Robert. Are you there? Good. Mm, I think you've, you're on mute there, Robert, or you're finding it difficult to, to take the mute off. I think you've been given permission, um, but the mute's not on. I'm going to read out your question. Where, so Robert says he's volunteered to complete the costing section of a bid for a community on-site website. Um, I'd like to discuss potential options with South Cam's new media team to ensure my ideas are in line with theirs. Is this feasible? And he reckons he wouldn't cost too much, really. But um, is it possible to put? Is, uh -huh. it, is it possible? Hello, Rob. Is it possible to sure. include those kind of costs of resource people into a grant? I suppose is the question. No, that actually, that wasn't the question. Oh, um, sorry, the, Robert. The, the question. Sorry, I, I'm a, I'm on a phone outside. It's, it's okay. a nice evening. I, I couldn't work out how to unmute it. Okay. Um, yeah, the the question is really to, to the opportunity to have a consultation with the new media team first to actually make sure that. A, there isn't something that they've got in, in already that we could reuse because that would be, you know, why spend any money if you don't have to? Uh, and B, um, to make sure if we do have a solution to actually discuss potential solutions with them with a view to maybe producing something that other uh, um, applicants or other communities could actually reuse. The idea of trying to get the best value for money and the biggest bang for our buck out of, of what we're doing. Yep, thank you very much. Panel? I was slightly confused by the question. I don't know if any of the other panellists are clearer than me. So the, the new media team, do you, I, I'm I, unclear as to, as to what, um, what okay, it I'm, is. I'm, I'm not, presumably there, there's a department or a team in South Cams that are actually responsible for um, electronic communications, producing websites, that sort of stuff. Our right, communication team generally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, I don't know what you call them. So I, I just yeah. use just a generic term. So apologies for that. I, I mean, they're a very helpful bunch, so I'm sure um, we could put you in touch with them, and they 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 may work if they can help. If they can help without you know it taking them forever, if they, I'm sure they will. That would be fantastic. And, and again, I, I don't want to take up a lot of their time, but I, I'd quite like to have a quick chat with them just to to, to share my thoughts to to just make sure that what I'm doing is is in line with their thinking. Great. So maybe you could um, get in contact with Emma, um, Robert, yep. and she will help you by email and she'll be able to help you in terms of the contacts. We've got a lovely media comms team. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, um, for that set of questions. There's a whole amount of information and it's just so lovely hearing examples as well from everybody of what they've been doing so far and what we've learned, I think, over the last two rounds of our zero carbon community grants, which are by far the most popular of our of our grants, really. And they are really starting to cause you know this momentum at, at the local level, which is fantastic because we can't meet our district zero carbon targets that we've committed to without you. Um, and, and that's that's just it. So we have to do all of this together. Thank you to this fantastic panel that we've had here. So thank you, Sally. And I know that Mark's in the background as well. There, but thank you, Sally, so much for such a clear presentation. And I know that you'll be on hand to help everybody as well. Cheryl, you just wowed everybody. It was just so lovely to be immersed in what it's like to have that kind of community engagement. Um, give us all this lovely, lovely glow because you're just doing it so well. Um, and to Emma and Siobhan, as always, who are the leaders in this, who are really taking our aspirations, ambitions, meeting them with yours out in the community. And we're looking forward to hearing from you and receiving your applications. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.